<clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Chair of the Scientific Council. I must say it is really a pleasure and a great privilege to have this opportunity to speak to you, uh, such an impressive audience in such a beautiful place, my goodness. Um, I think of, I've been working on the middle class issue uh, in developing countries for the last couple of years, and I must say coming to the Netherlands reminds me that there's a sense in which this is the birthplace or one of the birthplaces, maybe after Venice, of uh, the merchant, entrepreneurial, middle class, the prosperous middle class that demanded good government. Uh, it reminds me, even being in the church of the still lifes of the early 17th century, Vermeer, and all of that. So it's really a delight to be here. I'm also reminded of globalization being in the Netherlands because everybody speaks English so wonderfully. Um, you are truly the seagoing global center in a sense. Well, um, I want to talk to you today about uh, something that I call the global social contract. But before I do that, I want to start with a couple of observations about the ongoing financial crisis. Uh, and behind the financial crisis, the excitement in my own country about uh, an incoming new president. We have this energy right now, kind of fear about the crisis and hopes for a new president to do better. But let me start with these two observations about the crisis before I go to the heart of what I want to say today. The first is that the crisis will not lead to a rejection of the fundamental market model that is behind globalization as we think of it. It's certainly going to lead to a change, a redrawing of the line between the government of, and the state and to a more activist state in many respects in the rich world. Um, I think on the one hand, American style cowboy capitalism, if you want to call it that, is now really under siege. Markets will not be unfettered anymore. They will be fettered. The state is resurgent uh, already, especially in the US and the UK. I think Hayun will, will talk more about that particular point. Uh, we could say that the era of Reagan and Thatcher has run its course. Uh, there will be more spending, in, ideally on infrastructure, on health and education in my country, uh, maybe less ideally on uh, protecting domestic industries in the hope of protecting jobs. So that's on the one hand. I'm an economist. You'll get a little bit of on the one hand, on the other hand. On the other hand, what Churchill said about democracy is true about the market. It doesn't work very well, but it's better than any of the alternatives that we have. I think there will be happily an emphasis in the US, even in Europe, on an expanded domestic social contract. Uh, oriented to the middle class as well as the poor, to protecting the middle class from the downsides of financial crises and of globalization in general. Um, that's certainly coming out. You will have heard it if you followed the campaign rhetoric of President-elect Obama. Uh, it was something that Larry Summers, who was the chief economist at the World Bank and head of the Treasury, all of you probably know who he is, emphasized in his columns in the Financial Times over the last several, some months, two quarters. And it is said that that is the reason, the fundamental reason why President-elect Obama wanted Larry Summers to be in the White House with him because of his emphasis on uh, protecting the middle class as well as the poor from the downside of globalization. So, and for political reasons, not just for economic or moral reasons, but for political reasons because uh, 
Otherwise, globalization will not be saved from itself, you could say, and there will be a turn away from the market in, in the worst forms. So that's the first observation. Second observation is that the crisis has driven home everywhere in the rich world, in my view, the reality of our interdependence, interdependence across countries and between rich and poor world. It's driven home the idea of hyperconnectivity that globalization implies. And as a result, we've seen in response to the crisis really a desperate effort across the world to ensure some kind of international coordination of macroeconomic policy to avoid the, the risks of a real depression at the global level. We saw for the first time a meeting of 20 instead of just seven heads of state in Washington in November. I think we're seeing the, the sort of the nail in the coffin of the G7. I don't know how that will be seen in the Netherlands, maybe um, happily. Uh, I think we're going to see now that we live in a world where it will maybe not be the G20, but it won't be the G7 anymore, That, uh, except maybe one or two more times that you'll be reading and hearing about. And we're seeing, for the first time, at least in the US, a deeper understanding of our dependence on China and less directly on other large emerging markets whose growth we are all depending on in the next year or two to sustain growth and avoid a deep global recession worldwide. So interdependence is, is on the agenda again in a way in the US as it was briefly after 9-11, when suddenly many Americans woke up to the fact that there are a lot of people out there, poor people in particular, uh, in other countries whose uh, welfare is interacting and does interact with Americans' welfare and whose behavior can affect American security and prosperity. So what do these two observations have to do with development? and a development agenda in the face of globalization. Uh, I propose to characterize the development agenda as in large part the construction in this century, as opposed to the last, by an activist international community, a more activist state at the global level, of a global social contract that would maximize the benefits of globalization and of interdependence of our hyperconnectivity while minimizing the risks and costs on the downside to the poor in the developing world and to the incipient but still fragile middle class in developing countries. For the same reasons, including political as well as moral and economic, that we have constructed in the mature Western economies a domestic social contract, we now need to think in a world of interdependence and globalization about something on the order of a global social contract. The advantage of thinking of development agenda in terms of a global social contract is that there is a more emphasis in the social contract context on a shared agenda in which all parties have an interest. Uh, and there's more, in contrast actually, to thinking of development primarily as about transfers, charity, from one set of countries to another, the global social contract bespeaks a shared agenda. It also calls to mind the importance of cooperation across countries in shaping and implementing uh, this, this social contract. Well, a shared and a cooperative agenda at the international level is hard. It's hard to do. It certainly needs leadership, and I'll come back to that in a few moments. But I think we in the US 
should and will be looking to Europe, actually, for leadership on this issue, because it is in Europe that the domestic social contract has been better developed. And I think governments in Europe are more accountable than uh, my own government for implementing and sustaining a reasonable domestic social contract. And indeed, governments in Europe, including the government of the Netherlands, has, is seen at the global level as standing for some of the characteristics of a good social contract. Uh, I think particularly of the leadership in the Netherlands on women's issues in the developing countries um, and the emphasis on health and education over many years. So for the remainder of my time, I have three parts to what I want to say, and I do want to interject and make sure that the chairman or someone who's in charge will alert me when I have just, say, five minutes left. My husband claims that I talk too much. And so I don't want to talk too much or too long. All right, so I have three parts to what I want to say now. First, why a global social contract? Uh, second, why social? And third, ideas for the development agenda framed as inputs to this global social contract. So first, why global? And here it's already obvious, but I want to emphasize still more the reality that what happens in the developing world matters very much for security and prosperity in the rich world. Let me say a little bit about it in terms of uh, both opportunities and risks. On the opportunity side, Future global opportunities, future opportunities for us in rich world land, in Europe and America, Australia, Japan, depend increasingly on healthy, stable growth out there. Uh, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, soon will exceed in economic size the current economic size of the G7. This year, 2008, all of the US growth, as small as it has been, and actually now the conclusion is there hasn't been growth, but what we thought was all of US growth a, a month or two ago, was due to exports, due to the fact that the US has trade. And more than one-third of exports from the U.S. go to developing countries. There are a lot of other factoids I could give you. But the bottom line, which is pretty much understood, I think, in a country like the Netherlands, more than in my own country, is that with the aging of rich country populations and this shrinking of their relative size, growth, and development and good government in what are now developing countries matters immensely in terms of opportunities for innovation, for investment, for trade, and so on. At the same time, even in China and India, which are geopolitically ascendant and economically ascendant, even in those countries, the societies are contending with tremendous problems that are rooted in high levels of poverty and misery uh, and the difficulty of governing when most people are very poor and there is no real middle class to demand good government and hold government accountable. So if you think even of the problem in Mumbai recently, it's just one example. There are many developing countries that 10 years ago we thought were on the road to tranquility and progress, like Zimbabwe, that are now clearly in trouble, like Cote d'Ivoire, now clearly in trouble. Uh, we have in Latin America, Bolivia and Ecuador with populist troubles who knows what direction they will take. Even countries with solid, responsible leadership 
I think of Ghana, which I think is having an election in the next couple of days. Uh, if it works well, it'll be really a, an excellent transition to a second democratically elected government there. But even countries like Ghana face daunting problems uh, with even where, because responsible leaders don't generally have substantial support below them in managing their government and managing uh, their challenges and dealing with their challenges. There's very limited capacity across the board. It's very difficult to root out corruption and so on. So all these countries pose in various ways risks to those of us who are lucky enough to be living in the rich world. And I'll just go through a quick list. Uh, you're all familiar with most of these. Deforestation that's uncontrolled in Brazil and Indonesia and in the Congo and Africa uh, add to the risks that climate change is bringing to all of us. Avian flu was incubated in Vietnam. Terrorist groups in the Philippines and Pakistan. Instability in oil-rich delta in Nigeria. Consumer safety standards that are not adequate in China. The list goes on. So the point is that a global social contract matters from the rich country interest point of view simply because we help ourselves by finding multiple ways to work with developing countries and to help. Foreign aid, absolutely, and beyond foreign aid. The silver lining in the cloud after 9-11, I, as I mentioned in the US, was greater awareness of those countries and those people out there. I think it's possible to consider that the silver lining in the cloud of despair over the uh, financial and economic crisis could be a renewed understanding that we depend on developing countries and their peoples as much as they depend on us. Let me go to the second point. Why social? Why a global social contract? And here I'm going to do another on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, market reform has delivered in the developing world. Uh, in China, in the East Asian Tigers earlier, we'll hear a little bit more of this from the second speaker who may characterize it in a different way, which will make it interesting for discussion. But there's no question that in China, for example, it was liberalization of agriculture that jump-started the growth process. In India, it was a turn to a more business-friendly approach in government, and then the opening of the economy in the early 1990s, which triggered and then sustained what has been very rapid growth in that country. And in Latin America and Africa, though growth has not been as healthy or as rapid as in India and China, it is very interesting, particularly in Africa, that in the last six or seven years, mo the average rate of growth in sub-Saharan Africa has been about 6%, and more rapid than that uh, in the, amongst the democracies in sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of that growth was built on finally good, solid macroeconomic fundamentals, avoiding inflation, uh, dealing with some of the state enterprises which earlier had been hemorrhaging public money and that sort of thing. These were the classic IMF and World Bank imported reforms. It may not have been because of the loans of the World Bank and the IMF. It may have been because of a change in norms brought about by globalization itself. But we saw in Africa and similarly in Latin America in the last decade, much better policy environment on the macro side. Still lots of problems on the micro side, but a better policy environment. Mostly built around market-oriented reforms. So these reforms have delivered on growth, and they've also delivered on poverty reduction indirectly. 
millions and millions of people um, moving out of poverty, defined at $1 a day, $2 a day in China and India. And finally, uh, some movement in terms of people escaping poverty in Africa, in countries like Brazil and Mexico. And a lot of it did have to do, let me repeat, with openness to foreign investment, emphasis on exports, uh, living in a globalized system, in a global economy. But there are three shortcomings of globalization that I want to emphasize in the context of social contract. The first one is that markets do leave people and countries behind. Markets reward productive assets. If you have the right productive asset, you will gain from a deeper, richer, larger global market. And the classic example, of course, is education. People who have higher education anywhere in the world have been realizing greater and greater premia relative to people without higher education for the last 20 or 30 years. In effect, because the supply of higher education, although it's been very it's been increasing, has not been able to keep up with the increasing demand for highly skilled people. With the internet, the World Wide Web, the spread of technology, the premium on uh, innovation, the premium on flexibility, and so on, all over the world. For countries, there's also a key asset, as for people. For people, it's higher education. For countries, development economists have tried, you know, different ideas about, well, what's the key asset? What's the magic bullet? Uh, the conclusion at the moment, uh, and I think it's been the conclusion for now, uh, it's endured for at least a decade, is that the key asset for poor countries, and for countries in general, is stable and sound government institutions. That honor property rights in one form or another. A good example of a bad asset for developing countries is heavy dependence on primary commodity exports. And that's true whether it's cotton and coffee or oil or other minerals. If you're very poor and you're not yet a mature democracy and you don't have a middle class and you don't have accountable government, the worst thing that can happen to you is to have a lot of oil. And if you're poor without oil but you depend mostly on cotton or coffee or tea, you're in trouble. That's what history tells us, at least history of the last 30 or 40 years. Countries that entered the 1980s heavily dependent primarily on commodity exports have simply not done well. It wasn't the right asset. Countries that got into manufacturing that diversified are the ones that have grown rapidly, or in the case of India more recently, services. But the biggest difference between, say, a poor country in Africa, Malawi, and China, is not the difference in how open they were to the global system. Malawi has been an exporter, as are all commodity exporters by definition. If you're dependent on exporting coffee, and you're, you're, you're open, you're an open economy. But being open in the wrong commodity hasn't helped. And what happened, of course, is that the prices of primary commodities have been pretty much falling until the oddity in this past year of a price hike for food and then oil. Um, and the prices relative to these commodities of manufacturing has, have been rising. So markets leave many countries and many people behind. And I, I want to emphasize on the people side, in developing countries, we're not talking just about leaving poor people behind defined at $2 a day or below. We're talking about leaving the majority behind, really everyone except the very rich. Indeed, if you try to find 
in most low-income countries, those households where their income is more than $10 a day, but they are not in the top 5% of income of all households, that's my middle class. There aren't any. Even in India, everyone that you think of as middle class is amongst the top 5% in terms of income in India. So globalization, global markets, at the moment in most developing countries are leaving behind 70, 80% of the population. So that's the first shortcoming. Second shortcoming of markets and global markets in particular is volatility. And we're really feeling that today, especially volatility on the downside. Uh, poor countries face much higher volatility overall than rich countries. Uh, in terms of, tr for example, terms of trade changes can matter 5% one way or the other of GDP. Imagine in the Netherlands if overnight you had a 5% drop in your GDP. That would really be a shock. That's kind of, I want, don't want to say normal, but it happens often in poor developing countries. And of course, the financial markets are particularly the bearers of high levels of volatility, as we're seeing right now. And the problem with banking crises is that as, as terrible as they can be, in a rich country, they're usually only 2 or 3% of GDP. Maybe Sweden was 5 or 6% of GDP when it had its crisis in the early 1990s. But in developing countries, banking crises have generally been between 10, 20, and as high as 30% of GDP in terms of costs. So these crises generate huge public debt. That's very bad. It stifles investment. It stifles growth. It undermines job creation. It leads to high interest rates and crowding out of small businesses and jobs. It increases pressure on governments to run primary fiscal surpluses, that is, to run uh, expenditure systems in which they are saving money. Once you set aside the, the large amounts they have to spend to pay interest on the existing debt, Beyond that, they have to run surpluses, which makes it very difficult to invest in health and education, very difficult to manage counter-cyclical, that is, good spending uh, when a stimulus is needed to protect the poor, to pay food stamps, to pay unemployment insurance, and so on. So volatility is bad news for poor countries in general, and within countries, very bad news for the poor, uh, particularly in the developing world in emerging market economies. Third shortcoming. Markets fail to address the scarcity of what economists call public goods, uh, which are goods, products, services, where you can't make a buck if you're in the private sector. So the market doesn't respond to the demand for public goods. The classic quasi-public good is education everywhere in the world, or basic education. Governments finance basic education because individuals uh, or firms can't be sure to capture the benefits of educating you or me. I might grow up and not pay you back, literally. So the classic public good that everybody can understand, obviously, is pollution, or public bad is pollution. The good is uh, the air, the sink. The bad is pollution, where the polluter captures the benefits of gen making something without paying the costs of the attendant pollution. And of course, at the global, pub at the global level, we're talking about pollution in the form of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're talking about climate change. So this is a classic case of an underfunded public good having a, an atmosphere that is not um, getting warmer 
And here's where an activist international community has to step up. But the general point is that public goods are underfunded if you leave everything to the market. It's a, not an unusual statement, really. Um, one thing about climate change that I think is not well understood, at least in my country, is that although everyone will suffer uh, if we continue as we are now, poor people in developing countries will suffer by far the most. Uh, it's a terrible accident of nature, in a way, that the responsibility for the accumulation of greenhouse gas emissions lies almost entirely up to now in the rich world, but the costs will be borne much more heavily in the poor world, just because tropical agriculture, sea level rise, all of the problems that climate change will bring uh, tend to be concentrated around the equator and beyond. Uh, the movement of health vectors, malaria and so on, will be a problem. Uh, we have really sobering analysis at my center suggesting that unless things are fixed, there would be, for example, in India, a reduction in agriculture product of as much as 30 or 40 percent over the next 60 or 70 years and in the African Sahel, even worse. And of course, when you're poor, the adjustment costs are harder to bear, and the welfare costs of having to move or losing your job or your income or your farm or whatever uh, are much more devastating to families. There are other underfunded global public goods, R&D, research and development in tropical agriculture, the need for a green revolution in Africa, uh, underspending to develop a malaria vaccine. These are examples of other global public goods um, that are, so I'm doing five minutes? Okay. So let me go to part three, the ideas for a development agenda if you're thinking in terms of a global social contract. And I'll just mention several as examples. There are many more that could be explored and that should be explored. First, I want to emphasize do no harm. I think in developing a sound development agenda focused on a global social contract, much more emphasis in the rich world ought to be put on just avoiding harm. Uh, of course, climate change is one example, but in the face of this financial crisis, if the rich world returns to the 1930s, uh, looks inward, protects its own industries, worries about its own jobs, has a short-term view of its own good, instead of an understanding in the long run of what's good for everybody, that will do tremendous harm. It will be calamitous in developing countries, which are open economies, have engaged with the rest of the world, depend on trade, and the interchange of people through migration, and so on. I won't say too much more about that, but I think here, is one of the few places where the U.S., for all its sins, is actually doing a little bit better on the trade side than here in Europe with your common agricultural policy. Well, I don't know which is worse, um, but quantitatively and analytically, the common agricultural policy is inflicting more harm. We also have problems in the intellectual property rights regime. We have problems in the rich world about uh, migration. Uh, developing countries benefit tremendously from the emigration of both their skilled and unskilled people. I won't go into that too much, but I'd be delighted to talk more about it. So when we put up barriers to the entry of people from far away, we're harming ourselves and we're undermining their sending countries' um, prospects for development. There are other areas of do no harm. The Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is a good thing that the Netherlands is engaged in. Uh, ensuring that corruption 
is it does not start with multinationals based in the rich world. That's a good thing. The Kimberley process, the equator principles, for those of you familiar with these, those are all important areas where um, there's positive efforts to avoid doing harm. Second, do some good. And here we come to the aid issue. I think it's very useful to frame development aid as the counterpart in a global social contract to domestic public spending on health, education, credit for small business, infrastructure. Every citizen in the rich world can understand this point. And to retain the benefits of an open global economy, we need to nurture the middle class in the developing world and protect it as well as the poor, just as we do inside uh, our national uh, boundaries. We need to ensure losers when the market brings creative destruction against the risks of long unemployment. We need to provide training and retraining. All of those things that uh, Northern Europe did for um, Spain and Ireland, we need as the Western world and rich world to do for developing countries for our own good. Just compare in your mind as important as it is that in this country, this country has reached the threshold and beyond of 0.7% of GDP for foreign aid. Ask yourself how much is spent in this country on transfers uh, and on creating opportunities through health, education, pension, uh, protecting people from risks, unemployment insurance, I'm sure it's 20, 30 percent um, compared to 0.7 percent. So we have a long way to go in thinking about aid. Um, our work at the center suggests aid should be better targeted to the poorest countries. Uh, the U.S. has a particular problem there. In developing countries with responsible government, less micromanaged. In developing countries with corrupt governments, much more focused on health and education in particular, and much more focused on results and outcomes. Uh, all aid should have more emphasis on independent evaluation, on learning, as time goes along, what's working and what isn't working. And aid should be more multilateral and more um, focused on global public goods. And let me come quickly to those if I can have a few more minutes. As another topic, we've, as a third topic under ideas for a development agenda, spend more on those global public goods that I was talking about, including spending at home on scientific work, on research and development that can matter for developing countries. There was a very nice article in the New York Times a few days ago about research in the Netherlands on capturing the methane emitted from livestock. That's development policy, indirectly. Uh, the sea level issue strikes me as one where the Dutch have no doubt been thinking about good technologies and can help in the medium term countries like Bangladesh deal with the pressures of sea level rise. Nanotechnology for electric cars, we were talking about a f in a few minutes ago. An, an advanced market commitment for health products, which I can explain or your development aficionados here can explain. And finally, fourth item on an agenda is to go multilateral. And here I want to emphasize the crying need that Europe, the European governments engaged in development cooperation press hard for reform, strengthening of the global financial institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the regional development banks, but also deep reform of those institutions. And I'm referring here to their governance. There is a terrible failure of representation of developing of the developing world in these institutions. And just as we're going to see a move from the G7 to a G20, we need to see a move in those institutions toward greater representation, both in terms of voice, obviously in terms of votes, 
And even, yes, in terms of how the heads of the two institutions, the IMF and uh, the World Bank, are chosen. Here's where the Europeans can take leadership with an incoming uh, administration in the US and finally get to a deal that would say, we do not have to keep a lock hold on the heads, headships of these two institutions. It's important to get China and India at the table to talk about dealing with the financial crisis, to talk about climate change, and for them to become also responsible global stewards. Let me close uh, with a kind of concluding statement and then a comment on small countries. We need a more effective international or global polity to go with our global economy, with strong, backed by strong, legitimate institutions, the UN and those I've mentioned, and by, with legitimate democratic representative uh, governance. Why? To construct and maintain and defend a global social contract that, of course, includes aid transfers, but also in everyone's interests, arrangements, rules, regimes, governing trade, migration, investment, to manage global financial risks, to create a better world for poor people. Uh, it's a development agenda and wrapped up into a global social contract. For rich countries, let me, let me leave further conclusions to later and just make a comment about the role of small countries since we're here in the Netherlands. Tremendous leadership has been shown in this country over the last 20 years or more. Very high value for money from your aid budget in terms of leverage, leveraging other countries' attitudes and behavior and transfers to developing countries, and in terms of leveraging better policies in our global institutions. There's a sense in which small countries, like poor countries, gain the most when everyone is playing by the rules of the game. So I'd just like to close by saying I leave it up to you to work on this global social contract. Thank you very much.